Hey, future respiratory therapist. Hey, we're going to answer three questions here for you in as little as time as possible. Okay, now there's lots of value in here, so don't cut this video off. Check it out to the end because the last scenario is one you're definitely going to want to pay attention to and listen to. Okay, I promise it's got to do with flow and eye time. You're not going to want to miss it. But three weeks ago, I had um, a young man by the name of Daniel asked me if I could talk about C-Flex on the V60. So I'm going to talk to that. I'm going to answer that question for him here real quick. So when you're working with the V60, you have an option for this mode called C-Flex. Okay. Now all this is is a CPAP mode of non-invasive ventilation. Okay, that's all it is. There's no inspiratory pressure. There's it's just like CPAP. So we understand CPAP. We have a pressure waveform. We hold the pressure here like this. The patient breathes in and pressure dips down. It comes back up, dips down, it comes back up. This is when the diaphragm is dropping. The pressure increases during the diaphragm rising back up. And this is what we see. Now here's what happens with some of the patients. Some of the patients don't like to wear CPAP. They don't like the mode CPAP because they feel like they can't exhale. They feel like it's too much pressure coming at them. So they become non-compliant with it. And that doesn't aid us in being able to do our job in getting them to be compliant with therapy to treat their disorder, whatever it may be. Probably usually in this case, when you're talking straight CPAP, obstructive sleep apnea. So what they did was they said, can we make this mode more comfortable? And so they came up with C-Flex. Now what C-Flex does is allow you to choose between the settings of one, two, or three. Now this is what you need to remember. One is the minimum, three is the max. So three is max, one is minimum. When I say minimum and max, what I mean is this. On C-Flex, as the patient inhales and as inhalation ends and exhalation begins, you're actually going to get a drop in the CPAP pressure. So if you're on a CPAP of five, the pressure during exhalation is actually going to dip down and then come back up. And the reason it's doing that is to make it easier for the patient to exhale so they don't feel like they're trying to exhale against all of this pressure. Now, a C-Flex with a setting of one is going to give you a very minimal drop in pressure. You just have to look at it to see what it does. Do not confuse this with the fact that a C-Flex of one means that if you're at a CPAP of five, then it's going to drop to four on exhalation. That's not what I'm saying. And it also doesn't sustain there on exhalation. It only briefly drops at the beginning of the expiratory phase and then returns back to the CPAP setting. Okay? Now, if you have it set on three, then you may go from five to two or five to three or five to three point five. It, you don't, it, it, it's not centimeters of water pressure. It's just that if you have a C flex of three with a CPAP of of eight centimeters of water pressure set, then three is going to give you the max relief in pressure at the beginning of exhalation to allow the patient to have an easier time to exhale. And that's what C-Flex is. So what you do here is you talk to your patients. If they're non-compliant with their CPAP, okay, with the V60 and you have them in CPAP mode and they're not compliant with them, you talk to them and you say, hey, let's try this mode. And if they like the drop in pressure, you say, that's good. And then you say, okay, that was one. Let's go to two. Do you like this better? And they go, no, one was good. Two's better. Okay. And set them on that. This isn't going to change anything. It doesn't affect ventilation. All it does is affect the patient's comfort level during their CPAP therapy. Okay. So that's what C-Flex is. I appreciate you asking me, Daniel. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Now, if you remember... Back several weeks back, I put a video out there about AVAPs. Now we remember what AVAPs is. It's when we talk about AVAPs, we're talking about average 
volume assured pressure support. This was a closed loop, non-invasive mode of mechanical ventilation that changed the pressure support to achieve a target tidal volume, much like PRVC on a ventilator. Okay, now Liz wants to know how is this different? How is AVAPS different from um, NIV, which is non invasive ventilation, versus high flow nasal cannula, such as Vapotherm, Airvo, OptiFlow, things like that? Okay, so when you think about these three things, how are they how are they different well first of all let's talk about how they're all alike okay so first thing is they are all non-invasive that's the first thing that's the most important thing these are all non-invasive therapies we're not talking about endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube when we're talking now you can have a, a tracheostomy patient on a, a bipap or even on avaps or even on high flow nasal cannula which would be a high flow tracheostomy too, right? <coughs> but but these are all essentially non invasive. Okay? That's the only thing that makes them similar. Other than that, you have to understand what you're getting into. Now, when you say not NIV, the only thing I can do is assume that you're either talking about BiPAP or CPAP. So how is AVAPS different than BiPAP, CPAP, and high flow nasal cannula? So let's break it down, okay? AVAPS, pressure changes to equal a target tidal volume, okay? Closed loop ventilation. Pressure will automatically change to assure that the tidal volume that is set will be reached. That's AVAPS. So you have a varying pressure. If you have, let me do it like this. It, actually, I'm gonna come back and do it like that in just a second. So let's talk about BiPAP now, okay? So now we got BiPAP right here. BiPAP is a set inspiratory and a set expiratory pressure. The pressures do not change Therefore, tidal volumes will change based off of your patient getting better or worse or based off of patient effort, okay? BiPAP can affect oxygenation as well as ventilation, so it can change your PaO2 and it can change your PaCO2 because you have an expiratory pressure set that functions like PEEP and you have an inspiratory pressure set that functions similar to an inspiratory pressure during pressure control or even pressure support during pressure support ventilation. But however you think about it, you have EPAP here and you go up to IPAP. The difference there equates the pressure support and generates a tidal volume and helps the patient take a larger tidal volume. Okay, so, so that's BiPAP. So ventilation and oxygenation. You have a patient that comes in with a high CO2 and a low pH. If you're not intubating and you say, give me 30 minutes on a BiPAP, or 30 minutes on a non-invasive ventilator, then you want to put them in BiPAP, not CPAP. Okay. When you put them in CPAP, you're thinking about basically the equivalence to PEEP and the patient breathes on top of this, this increased baseline. So it basically helps to treat things like obstructive sleep apnea, or you can use it to uh, get a like an acute uh, CHF exacerbation over their acute phase. You hit them with Lasix, put them on a CPAP of 10 or 12 with 100% oxygen. And as you diurese, as you get the fluid off, you maximize surface area and give lots of oxygen so you don't have this big giant shunt and you don't intubate this patient because of severe hypoxemia where you can achieve that with something like CPAP, which functions like PEEP. Only oxygenation of CPAP will not aid you in ventilation because it's a single expiratory pressure. It doesn't alter tidal volume, which doesn't alter minute ventilation. Therefore, it doesn't alter CO2, okay? Now, high flow nasal cannula 
kind of the oddball here, but you need to understand that high flow nasal cannula offers, depending on what device you're using, up to 60 liters per minute, and then anywhere from 21 to 100 percent oxygen when in, in regards to the FiO2. And this device, again, is used primarily for oxygenation issues. Now, there is an argument out there, and there's a little, little bit of research out there that states that these high-flow devices, with the flow being as high as what they can offer, that they are capable of washing out anatomical dead space. Well, now, when you wash out anatomical dead space, you don't necessarily increase the patient's actual size of their tidal volume. But by washing out anatomical dead space, you do actually increase the amount of alveolar tidal volume, which increases alveolar minute volume and can have some effect on CO2 removal. But it's very small. Definitely if you have a patient with a, you know, a pH of 7.19722 you know, in a CO2 of 60 or 65, you're not going to think, let's put them on high flow and, 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 and flush out their anatomical dead space. That's, that's not where you're thinking here, okay? This is, this is the COPD or that you could put on 50 liters per minute with an FiO2 of 35% and keep them off the vent from being reintubated or maybe even having to go on the vent in the first place, okay? So high flow nasal cannula does nothing to alter the depth or the size of the, the breath, it just reduces anatomical dead space, provides, it's a, it's a phenomenal oxygenation device. I lo, I, I'm a high flow junkie, to be honest with you. Anytime I extubate somebody who's questionable, I extubate to high flow. And so, um, it doesn't make it right. It just is, is my experience with it is very, very, I've had good outcomes with it. And so I love the new, uh, the, the Airvo and, I, and the Vapotherm. I love their, their, their clinical application. It seems to be really well and they work really well. They do a good job oxygenating their patients. So, so you don't think high flow nasal cannula in the conversation with BiPAP or with AVAPs because both of these actually offer inspiratory assistance. They actually offer a pressure upon the inspiratory phase which alters the size of the patient's tidal volume, which alters the patient's minute ventilation, which alters CO2 removal, okay? So I think we kind of got high flow, vapor, therm, aerovo, optiflow, those things covered here. Um, CPAP remember, is just oxygenation. Now here's what I want to tell you real quick. When you think about AVAPs versus BiPAP, AVAPs versus BiPAP, if you have a patient going bad, you're going to see two different things here depending on what mode you're in, okay? So if you're in AVAPs, your pressure will be increasing. And that's because it's taking a higher inspiratory pressure. When I say pressure, I'm saying IPAP. Your IPAP will be increasing because it's taking a higher inspiratory pressure to achieve the target tidal volume that you have set. So patient's inspiratory effort goes down. The vent says, wait a second, we need more pressure. We've got to get this tidal volume up. So the patient is getting worse. They're requiring a higher pressure to achieve that tidal volume. Now, this is the exact opposite of what you will see when you talk about BiPAP. With BiPAP, you have a set inspiratory pressure. It does not change. So your inspiratory pressure stays the same, but you will be seeing your tidal volumes going down. So you have got to know if you're only looking at tidal volume and you have a patient at AVAPS, you're going to miss it because your AVAPS mode is set up to assure that target tidal volume. So you look and you go, oh, my tidal volume is 500. Good. My tidal volume is 500. Good. My tidal volume is 500. Good. It should be 500 because you have told it to target 500 or 410 or whatever it is you have it told it to target, right? So you have to understand your tidal volume should be what you have it set to target. But what if the first time your tidal volume is 500 and your pressure is 18, the second time it's 20, and the third time it's 500, it's 26, but you missed the changing pressures. See? 
Your patient's getting worse, but you're only looking at the tidal volume, you're going to miss it. So you got to understand that in AVAPs, you have to monitor your, your, your inspiratory pressure that is changing to assure those tidal volumes. And in BiPAP, where you have a set IPAP and a set EPAP, these won't change. So now your tidal volume will be your indicator of your patient getting better or worse. Okay? Watch their, if their tidal volumes are going down and the patient's probably getting uh, uh, more and more tachyptic to, to ensure that that minute volume is being reached. So you just got to watch it that way. Okay? So one last question that we have here, and this is the one I told you on top of what we just talked about. This is with the Trilogy ventilator which is a home vent there's a person who who uh said i'm not an rt but i'm a vent user which i assume means that they're on the ventilator and they watched my most recent video about flow hunger and they said this makes a lot of sense but i use the trilogy vent and setting flow is not an option so is it the vent just changing the flow to its algorithm or am I missing something? So the question is about flow and that you can't set flow on this ventilator. But guess what you can set? Okay, this, this question comes from Matthew. So Matthew, guess what you can set? When you're in using the Trilogy, there's first of all, there's six different pressure settings and, and flow is not going to be set on any of the pressure settings. Remember, when you set pressure flow becomes variable. Okay? So if you want more flow in a pressure setting, you got to increase your pressure because then the vent will give more flow to achieve a higher pressure. Okay? So we're only talking about adjusting flow in our volume modes. Okay? So you're talking about volume control, assist control, VCAC, or VCSIMV. And there's vents out there that have gone to where it's not so much a flow setting, but now you set an eye time. So you don't set a flow, but instead you set eye time. Okay? This is what you have to know, future respiratory therapist. Okay? How do I adjust the flow if I have a patient that's flow hungry on a vent in volume control and we're not, we're not setting flow, we're setting eye time. Because you can do that in some vents. So servo eye is a good example. You set the eye time instead of the flow. You have to understand that a longer eye time equals a lower flow. Okay? Now, if you want to increase flow then you, you will decrease your eye time. These two things go hand in hand. Flow establishes eye time. If you're setting eye time, then you're establishing flow. The faster you give the flow, the shorter the eye time will be. Okay, the slower the flow, the longer the eye time. And that's what I want you guys to grasp. When we're talking flow, you have to understand how flow affects eye time and vice versa. So important here, guys, okay? So Matthew, look at your vent. Look at your eye time setting. If you want your flow to be higher, talk to your home health person about decreasing your eye time because that'll make your flow higher, okay? If you make your eye time longer, so let's say your eye time set on one second. If you set it on two seconds, then the vent's going to give the flow slower to deliver that same tidal volume over a longer period of time. Make it smaller, then the vent says, well, I have to deliver this much volume, so I must give it quicker. And to do so, it must increase flow. Hey, guys, appreciate you guys sending these questions. Thank you so much for watching. And... If you have anything that didn't make sense from these videos, then please post it. Daniel, Liz, Matthew, if any of this doesn't make sense, give me another comment. I'll, I'll clear it up, clarify it for you, okay? Best wishes, guys.